I'm kind of glad the two presentations before me were quite good at running off the topic so well. And, and as uh, Mike from the CBA said, uh, he did say we need to talk to students. And this is quite an apt title because it is kind of what we did. And I'll basically talk to you about the student perspective. And, and although there's two undergraduates in this room, or I think one of them left, but uh, <laughs> I used to be an undergraduate not four months ago, so uh, I still fresh. Uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the students' rea realities of being a student today in terms of finance, but also of education. Uh, but also through this, how we did similar projects as what, well, like structurally what Alison or David was talking about in, in doing these discussions and engaging and owning your projects, uh, in a sense is owning your own knowledge of, of your topic. Uh, but what we did was purely student, um, student led. Uh, so where am I? So here I kind of want to raise some of the ideas for consideration uh, before we look at the issues with education and professionalizing of higher education. You have this commercialization of it a little bit. And look at the student experience. And I'm currently involved at the UCL Petrie Museum. And I'll use that as a sort of separate example to, to, as a discussion point. Um, so we all know the neo knew that of education. <laughs> and uh, the long term, like, the, the the policy passed in 2010, and we're not really sure about the long-term impact, but maybe we can look to our American counterparts to see how that's affected them. But these, are, these numbers are from the NUS, and they were published on, on quite a lot of newspapers, and I think they're fairly accurate um, numbers. So 44,000 44, pounds of debt for a, a student after they graduate. That's a Scottish student, uh, uh, and 73 of them will probably not be able to pay off the student loan uh, in the coming years. Uh, and this whole project was like to curb a one billion debt deficit amongst education, and that's actually not happening with this new system. So you know this has been the reaction from students. Um, <laughs> and that was only 2010. So every year there's been a demonstration, there's been a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of let's say, discontent from the student population and of a generation of students of myself who just graduated. Unfortunately, I'm not the most representative student here because I, as you'll see later, I'm quite as, like here, two thirds of students work, as, as one of the delegates here pointed out. They work uh, part time. Uh, allegedly, they have to work 10 hours a week, but most of them work 20, 25, even almost full time jobs. And that's even students who don't necessarily have a family or children to look after. They're like uh, the young students of archaeology. So they work and they need to work. Uh, most of them, half of them are on loans, student loans, commercial loans as well, especially which are more risky and have more pressure on them to be repaid fairly quickly. So your average working time in a week is very, very much restrained. Uh, you have to study, you have to write your essays, you have to think about stuff, you have to supposedly be educated as an academic in an academic circle, learning about uh, maybe Hittites or theoretical ideas or history or whatever it is you're doing, and you have to work. And usually the work you do is not archaeology. You can't do CRM because they sent you for three weeks somewhere else. You have to attend class. Um, and so you have quite a limited range of opportunities to do. So these implications, uh, this is again from the National uh, Union of Students of Scotland. So by 2012, the amount of students that are working increased, uh, I should have added, increased by 20%. Uh, and a lot of students work through their revision periods, through their holidays. They might get like a, a day off at Christmas and then work for years. Uh, and you think, okay, students, it's not too hard, but it is, you know, their, their minds are, are there. Uh, so they're in growing debt. Uh, most students are in debt, overdrafts. And this is unnerving because there's a lack of graduate schemes, as we discussed in the previous uh, time of the session. There's really not a clear vision of, yes, I will be at a job for at least a year or two, and I can sort of plan ahead my move. You get on CRM, 
and that's three weeks and maybe they get you longer, but there's not really a planned prospect for archaeology. Not that there should be one, but I think there kind of should be one. Uh, I, feel, I feel that would at least change the attitude of the students towards postgraduate employment or studies, uh, which is the question here. Is, do you really want to consider archaeological employment with that quite large debt in terms of British standards, uh, large pressure, financial? You can't really afford to be two months out of a job looking for something to do archaeologically. And that eventually you just lose interest, I think, or, or, or possibilities are reduced because you don't have the opportunity to get those experiences. The qualification you spend four years doing or three years doing is just like worth nothing apparently uh, as, as the commercial people. Like, I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a rant here, but it's like it's worth nothing. Let's have a vocation. Uh, we don't need a degree. It's like, well, what did I do on? And <laughs> <laughs> oh, you need experience. It's like, well, I could have just done that from starters. And so now we're like, okay, well, screw it. What then? Feeling of insecurity, that's a big thing I think students, most students are quite anxious about their prospects. Oops, that, okay. So limits, limited time, limited money to invest in their own education and experience. And you're only a student once. You can be a student for a really long time, but <laughs> <laughs> most students are only students once for three years. And it's kind of a nice time. And I always went there, everybody told me, hey, I have a great time at university. And, and you just learn that you have to, that it's quite an anxious time for a lot of people. Um, so this is some of the projects that we did as students. This is uh, student-led. I don't think our university department had no involvement in it. We had, uh, it all kind of started with the Child Collective Discussion Group, which was a, kind of like Allison's project. We just had about 12 to 15 students every week or two weeks, depending on what study time. And we just, students were just invited to come and discuss whatever they wanted. Literally, it was, uh, some people were, they were shocked. It was, what? I can, whatever I want? Yes, whatever you want. We did Harris matrixes. We did theoretical discussions on, on, on time theory. That was mine. But, but we also did uh, uh, <coughs> discussions on public archaeology and involving the public. We also did, people had to pitch their dis dissertation. People came to pitch conference papers they wanted to do and wanted some feedback. A lot of the students, Actually, most of the students that were in that discussion group are now doing a research master's or master's in a topic that they came up with at that discussion group. So, and that was with feedback. We all sort of reinforced each other. The second one was in situ, which was an in-house periodical, I call it. It's like a magazine that students generated um, for archaeology in their own department. And we had other people contribute and write things for us from other places. But it was mainly for archaeology students to be involved with so they could write. Um, I quite liked arts, and so I, I invited all the artistic students from our group to sort of contribute. So they did the illustrations, and they did beautiful illustrations. They could have been involved in more editing and like the wording and how to sort of put it on a page and display. So the other one was EOP, which uh, was uh, was discussed earlier today. Um, so I won't go too much in it, but it was an Edinburgh archaeological outreach project where students went out to schools to. Uh, It'll be online. It'll be online. Yeah. Okay. It's been recorded. The talk. This talk. Well, this the one, talk. but the EOP. 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 <laughs> Had his talks been recorded. Okay, so there you can go look it up. Uh, the other one was Bones Collective Seminar. We did like an interdisciplinary joint uh, seminar with anthropology and archaeology, which apparently has never happened in our university. So it was like, oh, that seems kind of like be a parody there. And the other one was the Yadley Stone Circle project, which was also discussed yesterday, and uh, other tag sessions, which was a student-led, uh, well, independent, autonomous project, which was sort of initiated by David Connolly, to sort of just give us an idea and a space, and they just went out and carried out the project from beginning to end, uh, which was great training in project management, etc. So overall, 60 students were involved in these projects, which all the archaeology students at Edinburgh is about 100. So we have two-thirds of Edinburgh University students involved in these projects. The UCL Petrie Museum, I think, would be a good thing to look at because I'm involved there now in their archives. And they do sort of switch around their students around their museums. They can do archive, digital. So, and that's a museum that's in-house to their university. And they allow their students to be involved in it and work in it and get experience in it. 
Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind if we're talking about education, so just the issues from in situ. So it got a lot of traction, this project, a lot of good enthusiasm. People were, um, uh, people were really happy to come along and do whatever, essentially as just do whatever you want, and they did whatever they wanted, which is, I think, what education is about. Uh, we talked a lot about employment and training and uh, jobs, and that's great, but I personally feel that education at university is about getting educated in many more ways than just learning how to draw a section or how to sort of carry out a, a PDF or, or an Excel spreadsheet, but also to sort of engage with the ideas you're being immersed in. Um, so uh, all these projects had similarities. They were grassroots, student-led. They were autonomous, so there was no like supervisory institution. Flexible working time, and that's the real thing I want to talk about here, is that students with jobs and studies, they don't have two days to go on a site. They don't have a week to spend money on to get training. They don't have that time. They don't have that luxury. Thirds of students, when they do it, it is a big commitment. It's a big ask of these students. You're making, oh, well, go get some experience. So you might get a job later, so hopefully. And you're like, well, why would I do that? Um, and so this project were involved little team, little cost, little, little, they could do it from home most of the time. We just kind of got together for a drink maybe sometimes. And, but the main thing is I think they maximize their experience with very little involvement in terms of, of, of time commitment. So they could do it literally in their sleepless nights. Uh, low travel time required. It was like all at university and personal projects were encouraged, which is also quite, if we want to, like, you know, there was a talk about creative Scotland. If we want to push people to be creative, we have to ask them to be creative. We have to so provide a platform for which they can be creative too, but also say whatever you want. And it's a scary question. Literally, people were not, did not know what to do. Uh, eventually, they did fire. So some final thoughts about these things I want to tell you about. I'm doing OK for time. I think uh, I've not done it in six minutes. Um, is that uh, it's a high money and time commitment. So when you're studying, to also work and find, without much and decreasing financial support, um, to go out and get experience and volunteer. It's all like a fine idea, but it doesn't really happen. And if it does, it's really, it's a big ask. Uh, and these things, I feel, sort of allow people to develop experience in their own interests, uh, to develop in their own way, which I, th which I think is what education should be about. They can get training and a job later, I think. It's just, you go on a CRM, you can, you'll learn it in six months. I don't think it's like that. It's true. You know, you, if you sort of keep going at it. I think the university time should be a time for, for, for engaging with your peers and learning in depth your field and do whatever you want to do and do it well. Um, so we need to think of new higher education structure or employment structure because we are, unfortunately, in this socio-political situation with the economic status of, uh, seems to be like the worst things in 70 years, so they say. Um, it doesn't seem to be getting better. I don't think the political parties are going to switch anything anytime soon. Mm -hmm. They've gone their way, and we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it, though, by maybe some solidarity, but also not sticking to the old ways of doing it. It's now a different educational world. And this is why I'm happy. I, I plug that in. I like the skills passport a lot, and I think it's a great way of, of, of pushing those sort of personal development schemes. Because this is what it's all about, is pushing people to develop their own skills. And the skills passport is one that's, that's aimed, I think, at quite a specific employment arena. But it is, the idea is there. And, and pushing for more autonomous, for more personal development, because there's no support financial, uh, it would be a good sort of project in the future. So thank you. Particular questions, not discussion. Questions for Alex. More of a comment and something which um, the staff sort of reminded me something that someone said to me the other the week. Um, there's been a lot of talk at this conference about experts and whether we, we are or aren't the expert. Um, 
no one in a management position in a historic environment company or organisation or whatever, no one in an academic job knows what it's like to be a student at the moment because we haven't experienced it. And that's one area where students are the experts. They are experts in being students. Um, and it's only by engaging them in events like this, although well, not really, uh, um, but maybe they'll watch the video, um, that, that we can you know, make sure that your education is, is what you need. And obviously, you need to be guided by those of us who know what it's like outside education. But I think opening up a dialogue like this uh, is a really good thing. And I really like what's going on at Edinburgh. We've been having discussions uh, with our own archaeological society on the moment no one turns up. And they kept saying, pub, food, food. I like, and I said to them, has it dawned on you to do something that doesn't involve alcohol? And they looked at me like I was mad. <laughs> If I can, like, alcohol should be somewhat entrenched in it in some ways, but uh, <laughs> it's not, yeah. yeah. Sorry, can I just ask, uh, what's the um, contact hours at, in an undergraduate degree at, uh, where at you the, are? In the UK, uh, um, I mean, I can only speak from my universe, and yeah. like, I don't want like, it's not, I'm not trashing you, Edinburgh, it's just like, uh, don't fuck, hire me in the future, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think, for as far as I know, in the UK-wide, about if you do maybe you do three models a week, uh, a semester, and in these three models you might have two hours per module, and maybe a, a, a seminar or a workshop. So you have six to nine hours a week. Um, so it's less than a day of, of contact time. But you, you're, you're reading all the readings, obviously, so that takes a lot of time. That uh, yeah, well, I mean, like I think some of us are, but you know, we, we think, what is this? I don't know what. <laughs> I think it comes back, we've asked this a few times before, how much do we push students? How much do we encourage them? You know, how much do we let them do, the, whether it's the reading, getting involved in kind of extracurricular activities? You know, do they know about those extracurricular activities? I mean, I've personally been involved in surveying students' awareness of different organisations. Yeah, IFA, CBA, even sorry, uh, you know, Royal Archaeological Institute, Prehistoric Society, etc., etc. All of these, and you'd be appalled, really, at how little students know. You know. So I think there is a huge number of questions, and and I mean, we're going to have to take many questions unanswered from this uh, session today. And I think probably we need a whole conference for this. But I'm going to ask. Uh, I'll let you speak, and then we'll have our final presentation today. It's just a, a, a question. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, it strikes me that three years or four years is by any standard a long time and in that time you're well at least students starting a degree they, their ideas about what they're studying what their, their interests and ideas are, are going to change enormously and and evolve in response to the material they're being presented with and what we've heard today is lots of different uh, pathways through archaeology into archaeology i'm just wondering in your experience how well are those different pathways cyclists while they're emerging so at the end of the first year and the second year when you first doing field work, how much is it made clear to you? How, how many, how are the, the, these opportunities and pathways are presented, or are they not? I, 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 no, nobody told me, like, here's a pathway, like, there's no, uh, we d like, I think, I was one of the fortunate students that I didn't have to work, but I did it all, I did, like, I've done volunteering at museums, field work, and, and let's say the educational value of it is more intangible than, than, but, you know, you learn something. It's just like you don't know what you learned. And I think we like to think, oh, now I can do this, and that's something you've learned. In fact, you, it's more of a, you know, four years is a long time, and it's lo it's, it's, it is a short time, though, in terms of, of learning how to learn and how to think. There was a really good article in the IFA magazine that just came out about uh, a new appointment at the CAB, I think somewhere in Wales, and she said that it is easier to teach in a classroom because it's just, you just need the space. But it's harder to teach people the theoretical and over a long time. And I think that's kind of, let's say, what should happen at universities. It should be more of a long-term education about the education you're doing and not about the, the skills elsewhere. Although that would be great to do some, some practical placements, and, and I do mention graduate schemes and placements that you can do in your summer. Um, but the, the people talk about learning outcomes, like there's like a, like I learned critical thinking this month, uh, and I learned to, how to write uh, uh, book reviews now. Uh, and it's more of a gradual process. And it's only through this repeti repetitive thing, which part of these projects are sort of feeding into each other. And you do a bit, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yet. No, no, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I think, uh, thank you, Alex. I think we're going to have our uh, 